Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, uh, Wednesday morning, August the 17th. This is one child abuse survivor to another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room is open. I did pop the link into there to Robert Bernie's web pages. Uh, Robert Bernie, that's who we're looking at. We're looking at Robert Bernie's work. He's um, he's written a whole lot of stuff on and on his website and also has written a book. He's a he's a codependence um, counselor. He's a, a grief he's a he's a codependence therapist. He's a grief counselor. He's a, an author and he's written a book called Codependence: The Dance of Wounded Souls. And he's a spiritual teacher. He's got some great stuff there. So that's what we're looking at. We've been looking at his web pages uh, for probably about three months. And really, I was interested in the inner child healing work. And that's why I'm taking a look at his stuff really in depth, you know. And so we're kind of heading towards the end of his inner child healing work. But if you go to his site index, you can see that he's got all kinds of stuff there based on, I mean, all, all having to do with like uh, codependence, boundary work, inner child healing, relationship stuff, spirituality and whatnot. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of information there that we're not going to probably cover, but I hope everybody will go and take a look. I did pop the link into the chat room, and that's um, www.joy, J-O-Y, the number two, M-E-U dot com. That's his website. And um, he's got some great stuff there. I really like it. And also a friend of mine sent me the book, so I've actually got his book down, which is just awesome. And um, it's really helping me. I know every time I read stuff about the inner child healing process, it really helps helps me out a lot because I, I I had a lot of work to do in that area and I didn't quite know how to how to go about doing it. So um, I find his information very helpful. And so thanks everybody for tuning in to all my shows. I appreciate it. I know a lot of people listen to my shows and I have a lot of my friends listening to my shows and as well as other people that don't, have no idea who you are listening. And um, I appreciate you taking the time to do that, right? It's a lot of work keeping up with my shows and, um, and you know, so I do appreciate you taking the time and making the time to be on my journey with me, right? I appreciate it. So we'll get right into this this morning. You know, if you, uh, I'm not a counselor or therapist, right? I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own shows here on Blog Talk Radio. I started doing this in November 2009, so it's almost been two years. And, um, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows, right? I'm talking about abuse. Abuse is a sensitive subject, and it may bother people. It may bother you. You need to know what's good for you to listen to, and if you think the topics of abuse or anything related to abuse might bother you, you know, then don't listen to the show, right? Just turn it off. And if you're under the age of 18, 18 and under, I just ask that you have permission from an adult, somebody who's older who can help you make a decision, really, whether you should be listening to this show. There's a lot of adult content on my shows, and I just believe that children should be protected at all times. So if you're under 18, you know, you make sure that you have someone listen to the show with you. Have a parent, caregiver, somebody, a coach, teacher, you know, mentor, somebody listen to the show with you, and then they can help you decide whether or not age appropriately it's okay for you, right? So we'll get right into this 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 looking at the inner inner child healing work and really the this is the page that Robert Bernie uh wrote about um the process that he that he that he actually went through. He's a survivor and he says the re- the recovery process for inner child healing through the fear, he says. That's what he titled this one. And he's really talking about, you know, changing our relationship with fear. And you know, because fear is is, is uh, something that we took on. You know, it's, it's the damaged ego responds to its programming by generating fear of the things we learned to fear as a child: making mistakes, doing it wrong, being emotional, speaking our truth, uh, taking risks, being alone, not being alone, whatever it is, right? And then we we then empower the fear. He says by focusing on it, magnifying it, generally giving it the power to define our us in our life, or by denying it. So. He says, which also gives it power, because in denying our fear, we're denying ourself and our reality and our and reality. So he says, going to either extreme results in the inability to see the situation clearly. And then he goes on and he talks about uh, taking power away from the fear, and that's what we were, we were looking at yesterday. So he says, so he did that through through writing, and um, that's what he was talking about here. He says, he says, learning to be emotionally honest with ourselves is a whole other aspect of the processing. Dynamic. He says that I'm not going to talk about this article. He actually did a whole. He's already done a whole lot of um, articles about um, emotional honesty. He says I will get into that in another article in this series, and there are other articles on my website about that. He says what I will say about it uh, is that it is very important to do some of our processing verbally and through or through writing. So he says we do not get in touch with our feelings through thinking. So it is when we start talking about or writing about what is going on internally that we start actually feeling. And releasing the emotional energy, and I mean, yesterday that's kind of what I, was, I left off, sort of talking about that, you know, because I started 
I had always been thinking about my past and thinking about all this this stuff that had happened to me as a child and happened to my family, you know, and you know, growing up in this home, you know, and it always was just eating me up, and I was just thinking about it all the time, and sometimes I would tell people about it in my lifetime. I had people that I would, who would talk about their past, and I'd talk about mine, and it sort of gave me a, it was great because I did have somebody to talk to for a while, but, um, you know, it just, it just never really went anywhere, you know what I mean? It was not, not a real validation process for me, because the people that I was talking to weren't all that supportive about it, you know, and so, it, you know, it's it didn't really go anywhere. And so, um, uh, October of 2009, right after I started, right after, well, actually right before I started doing blog talk radio, um, I started to write a blog called Not So Fond Memories, Growing Up in an Addictive Home. And then right about the same time, I started doing blog talk radio. So I started writing and I started talking about it. And I think that that had a huge, um, this is really what I really attribute to my healing process too, is this it was writing my blog, because I'd come home every night after work or on the weekends, and I'd write these blog entries about exactly what happened to me as a child <clears throat> you know and I didn't want to sugarcoat it I just told it like it was you know and I said no truth is truth and truth hurts and truth needs to come out <laughs> you know because I mean this is this is something that I need to get out you know and so I started writing these blog entries and just you know just one one here whenever it just would come out you know what I mean and I didn't have to sit and think about it, it would just roll onto the page I was just like I'm just telling it like it is you know um and so that was helpful, right? It was a public-facing blog, so I wanted people to see it, and I really wanted people to, someone to see that I, what I had suffered as a child, and someone to, to know, you know, that this stuff happens, and that people, you know, there's so many of us survivors, right? So I really was just being, um, just wanting to be a voice for my inner child, really. And then I started talking about it. So I like what Robert Bernie has said here. He says, you know, we we do need to do some of that, I guess, in the process. But I. Like, I've never gone to counseling or therapy, and I've done all my stuff self-help. But I've seen that in various different places, you know, even looking at, um, you know, the Survivor to Thriver workbook or, or uh, you know, I know there's other books out there. There's all kinds of books that, that deal with healing, the healing process, that I would still like to get a hold of, you know, like Courage to Heal. And there's another one that, um, Healing the Shame that Binds You from John Bradshaw. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Courage to Heal. I'm not sure a woman wrote that, but I'm not sure who did. But anyway, there's lots of books out there. I mean, they're really they're self-help type books that would be great to have. You know what I mean? Like, I'd like to actually get a hold of those, too. I probably will at some point. Um, because I'm looking for just anything. Because I'm on, so I'm on my, my journey is self-help, right? So I'm looking for stuff that I can use, you know, for tools to help myself to, to get through this. But I, I feel so much better than I did four and a half years ago. It's like that. But he says... Um, he says there's certain other things that can help us to get in touch with the emotional energy, including including the various types of art, drawing, painting, collage, etc., movement in music, body work, etc. But the primary processing tools are writing or talking. I mean, I've met a lot of survivors, and um, just over the last few years, because especially because of what I'm doing online, you know, the work that I'm doing online, and there's so many people that do write and do write, you know, poetry and do write, uh, um, you know, journal entries and whatnot. And um, I belong to a couple of survivor groups and online survivor groups, and I know that a lot of those people, you know, use writing as well. So uh, it does seem to be part of the process. And so, you know, I I wrote my my blog, not to find memories growing up in an abusive home, and then turned it into a book, and that's a life of death, the redemption. And that that book is, uh, you know, Sandra uh, Sandra Potter from Dreamcatchers as well as Donna Shear saw it, and they said, you know, you should publish that. That your blog, like you should publish that into a book. A lot of people could benefit from from your information, and also other survivors could could see that, you know, and they could they could keep looking for that hope, you know. It could be very hopeful for people. So we, we published the book, and all the proceeds are going to Dreamcatchers for Abused Children, which is what I wanted. They didn't want that, but I did because I didn't want the money for that book, right? So both of my books that I published, um, A Life of Death, Redemption, and Levita Jubies, are both of those proceeds are both going to Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. I, I just I couldn't take the money for those books. And I, I wanted to really um, be able to give back, you know what I mean? And so the I just, you know, it was very helpful for me to write that stuff out. I needed to get that stuff out. And also talking, <clears throat> you know, doing this show has allowed me to get in touch with a lot of feelings that I that I had, you know, and sometimes I'll sit around and I'll think, oh, I feel pretty good these days, you know. I've been on my healing journey four and a half years and 
I feel pretty good, but all of a sudden I'll start talking about something and, and the anger starts. And I can see where I still need to work. You know, I can see where um, I may be having some resistance to some to some healing, you know, and also where I need to do some personal, you know, inner work. And so it, it has been very helpful to keep talking, keep keep writing. You know, I, I'm still writing, and I'm writing another book, actually. Um, so it is, it's been help, very, very helpful as far as my process goes. I don't know about everybody, right, but I know that for my process it certainly has been helpful. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of work with art, drawing, or painting, but I did some work with Ray Luskin. Ray Luskin is awesome. She, RayLuskin.net, if you just type in there, R-A-E-L-U-S-K-I-N.net. She's got a website, um, um, Art from My Heart. She's, she's got a book, and she's also, she's a, she's a survivor of uh, CSA, incest, and she's, she's a, she uses art to heal. She's been through every sort of um, healing process you can think of doing all this work with different therapists, counselors, and different types of things over the years. And she said she's pretty well seen it and done it all. And uh, what really worked for her was art. And so she likes to share that with people. I think that's awesome. So she comes on my show every now and then and does shows with me. And I find her information very helpful for me because I need... I, I, it's just one more avenue to get out to be able to process some of my stuff, right? So it is. It's awesome. So he says, so Robert Bernie says, writing about fear, he says, in the update announcement that sparked this article, I was processing through some levels of fear in order to become clearer on where the fear was coming from. So Robert Birdie says, this is his process that he's talking about. He says, I was having resistance to finishing an article, and since I knew that resistance comes primarily from fear, I was processing. At first, I looked at the reason that my head was telling me I was procrastinating, fear about stating a controversial truth in public. Almost as soon as I wrote that, I knew that that was not the main level been speaking and writing my controversial take on truth for many years now and that w- and that one does not have any real power anymore so he says i then went on to a different level that of fear of saying things in a way that a reader could use to beat themselves up with ultimately i am powerless over how someone reacts but it is something that i give some power to because i, I want to communicate as clearly and cleanly as possible so this is what he's he's talking about he's because he's a therapist he's a counselor right so he says by touching on that level of fear, I could put some effort into clear communication and then let go of the outcome. By focusing on a level and then surrendering to, to my ultimate, ultimate powerlessness over others, I can take a little of the fear that is out of, the, out of balance, out of the equation. So he says, the next level I touched on was that of the out-of-control out of feeling that I get with my writing. And this is jumping off the diving board kind of fear that is just inherent in the process for me because he does a lot of writing. If you go to his site index, you can see he's really a prolific writer. I mean, he's written all kinds of stuff here. Um, so he says there that there is a basis to feeling not in control of my writing process is proven by the reality that writing about my fears, that update has led to at least five other articles so far. So he, so he says, I was afraid of where the writing was going because I had a picture of what was supposed to be written next, of what my priorities were for my writing time and energy. And by acknowledging that certain things that certain things cause me to feel afraid because they feel out of control, I can I can take a little more fear out of the process. So he says through writing about that fear, I could get in touch with what at, what attitudes of mine were magnifying the fear, and that is how my picture of where I needed to focus my time and energy was causing me to resist going where the writing was taking me. So he says I'm responsible for how my perspective, my attitudes, set me up to have emotional responses when I'm not open to events unfolding in in way uh, different in different than I, I had planned. He says that I am setting myself up for feelings. So he says, when I think that things have to go a certain way for me to be okay, then I'm setting myself up to be a victim when they do not unfold the way I think they need to unfold. So he says, I'm making a choice to see life in a certain way. And that choice, uh, that attitude, then sets me up to be afraid of things uh, if things don't go, if things go differently than I want them to go. So I'm responsible for that fear. He says, I'm creating that fear out of the intellectual pr- paradigm, the expectations that I am choosing to empower. That's so true. I, I, I you know, I sort of, you know, I mean, that, that part I can understand what he's saying. You know, like so many times people, like I know just in my own journey in life, you know what I mean? If, if it's almost an issue. It's a control issue. You know, it's like, it's like okay, I, I need to be able to, to have this, this, this happen, you know, in this order. Right, and it all needs to happen like in this amount of time, and you know if and then if it doesn't, you know it, it's like it sort of sets me up to believe that oh, oh things aren't working, things are you know it's it's almost um and what I think that's just a fear of of um 
letting go of that control because actually like in most of of his stuff here like when you read through there especially the codependency stuff you can see where he's talking about that and he says you know there we really have very little control over anything um the only thing that we can control is is our is our own like what we put into our body uh what we eat for breakfast you know um what we decide we're going to we're going to do you know we, things can change throughout the day things change throughout our lives you know, we can't control anybody around us, that's for sure. I think we have very little control over people around us. Um, we might think we can manipulate somebody for so long, and some people are very great manipulators, but, I mean, as far as just controlling like what, what's going to happen at work that day, you know, that's there's very little control over that kind of stuff. And as far as controlling, you know, um, whether or not in 10 years, you know, I'm going to... Um, I'm gonna have a, a great job and a and a and a pension coming in. I mean, I don't know. There is a little bit of, you know, you, you just can't control the whole thing. You might be able to control parts of it, but not all of it. And anything can happen at any time. You know what I mean? So that's why I think it's, uh, you know, people try do really try to spend a lot of time trying to control everything and really, you know, they, they basically build up these fears because it's like, oh my God, what if, what if, what if, you know? It's like what. You know, I actually had this. I was working with this one person. I've never mentioned names. I was working with this one person that was saying to me, you know, talking about uh, something to do with life and being all about buying a home and doing all this stuff that people, you know, most people in society think is exactly what you have to do, which is that you have to be a homeowner, that you have to to do this, you have to do this and this, just to be considered to be, uh, you know, um, successful, right? And I told her, I said this to this person, I said, so I said, what happens if you lose all that stuff? You know what I mean? Like, th- what, what? then who are you? A loser? Right? Like, I was like, you're basing everything on material wealth, on material stuff, on your looks and everything else, right? Because she was always talking about her looks. And, you know, everything material was important to her. And I said, what happens when you lose your looks? Like, what happens when you lose that home? You lose your job. You lose your... I said, what, then you're just a loser? So you're just going to base everything... On material stuff, you know, but basically, I mean, because you know, because I mean, this person was kind of looking down at me because I worked, I worked with her for quite a few years, and I, and I, you know, I could tell, right? It's because I don't, I'm not a homeowner, you know, my looks, I'm like mid forties. I mean, they're only going to be what they are, and I have to be comfortable with that, you know. And it's like I told her, you have, I said, you could lose it all, you could lose it all, honey. You know what I mean? Like you, you don't want to base your 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 whole entire existence on material stuff <laughs> or you're going to be one sad person at the end of the road you know what I mean um, it's I don't know I just feel sorry for people like that I really do but those are I think that's fear that's fear on people people's uh, fears really coming into play and you can see it you know because I mean I and I guess it's easy for me to say that because I've lost everything before you know what I mean like I, I really never had anything and then the things that I have had I have lost and you know what I mean so I'm a, I'm a person who has experienced great loss in my life and so I don't base my life based on what society thinks is successful or or what society says, you know, is is what we're supposed to be seeking after. I basically ignore them and and go after what I think is important and value in life, you know what I mean? So I think I have that going for me, you know, but some people don't. And so there's a whole lot of fear around that. And I think that's uh, there is a whole lot of um stuff that people can do to set themselves up for these type of fears, you know, like you know, what happens if I don't have a pension? It's like, well, you may not live that long, you know what I mean? Like, you're really counting on a lot. <laughs> I know people have died in their teens, you know, 20s. I almost died, you know what I mean? Um, it's like, no, life is uncertain. And if you're going to base everything on the end of the road instead of the journey to get to where you're going, you know, it's all about the journey. It's not about the, the de- it's not about that one destination point where you're going to end up at the end of the road. You know what I mean? Because you may not ever get to that destination point. Um, things happen, right? <laughs> things happen all the time. And um, it's like people, you know, your journey is your journey. And I think if we can't enjoy the journey, there's no sense in even worrying about the destination point. You know, because, I mean, <clears throat> we don't know how long we're going to live, right? <clears throat> we don't know. I, I know, like, I've experienced a lot of death in my lifetime. So I knew, you know, that, hey, it's pretty short and it's pretty iffy. For, there's a whole lot of people living on the planet that, that, that have never thought about that. And so that's all they think about is the destination point. Oh, when I retire in about 40 years, it's like, if you retire, (laughs) 
if you even live that long, because, hey, I mean, people do, things happen, right? People do move on. So, you know, this is it. I, I just think that I, I like what Robert Bernie has to say. And he is talking a whole lot of truth here, like on his web pages. But he says, um, he says, if I have a picture and expectation of how I want life to look today, and you do something that messes up that picture, my codependent reaction is to get angry at you and blame you for messing up my day. So he says, this is doubly dishonest. First of all, I'm getting angry in response to my fear that I will not be okay if things do not work out as I had planned. And that is emotionally dishonest. He says, secondly, I'm blaming you for the feelings that are being caused by my attitudes, my expectations. And that is codependency. And that's that's what I, I'm i working on, you know, is 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 because I knew I know that I grew up in a codependent home and so in a codependent family. My family the family members that I have left are still codependent. And so, you know, I I stay away from them. They're too toxic. They're too um, you know, because they blame, you know, they're still doing that blame game of blaming somebody else for the way that for the way that they are, you know what I mean? It's kind of like and this and and that's why I'm trying to learn how to not do that. You know, he says he says I'm blaming you for the feelings that are being caused by my attitudes. My expectations, that's codependency. And I and it's just living your living life expecting, you know, to live it through someone else. You know what I mean? And then if things don't go exactly right, then, then of course there's a lot of harboring a lot of negative feelings and harboring a lot of um you know emotional you know emotional issues because of it. You know what I mean? And so codependency is a huge problem and most of the world is codependent. And now that I kind of know what it is, I sort of see that actually almost everybody has got some codependent traits, you know, and we can't help it because if you grow up in it and, and everybody else in society is codependent, you're going to kind of be like that too. But it is very, it's a very um, bizarre way to, to live. And actually it's weird that we all, a lot of us tend to be that way. So he says, um, in regard to the situation I've been talking about, there, there, are no, there was no other person involved. So I was getting angry and, at and blaming myself. So I was having a hard time finishing the article he was writing. And he says, I had a self-imposed deadline for finishing that article that was part of my agenda for how I saw the immediate future unfolding. So he says, I felt that I needed to finish that article so I could send out my update announcement so that I could get on to whatever the next important thing was um, or I thought I needed to get done. So he was trying to control, he says, I was trying to control my life by forcing an outcome. I was trying to control my life because I was afraid that I wouldn't get the things done that I thought I needed to to get done uh, to take care of myself, to meet my needs. So he says, I was afraid of the unknown future. So I had designed my own agenda. And it was getting angry and frustrated that I could not meet my own agenda. I think people, and he says, that's a whole judging thing, that whole blaming thing. That's what he talks about next. I was just going to say that. I think that's very true. Like many times we will, and especially growing up in an abusive household, you know I mean? Like if you were abused as a child, you know, it's very easy then to start, as an adult survivor of child abuse or you know adult survivor of a dysfunctional in, in childhood you know to to blame ourselves and to shame ourselves because you know we're not living up to even maybe even nobody else is putting these expectations on us just that just we are like maybe I could be putting a, a huge you know a lot of, of a pressure and expectations on myself you know what i mean and then because i was abused as a child and i had to and i and i had to put up with so many very negative you know um um, negative, really, uh, behaviors, really, the, the styles of, of behaving that my parents showed me exactly how to do, um, you know, then I'm, all of a sudden I'm blaming myself. I'm shaming myself. It's like, well, you know, I should be doing this and I should be here and I should be, you know, I don't know why I haven't accomplished this yet. And all of a sudden then we're kicking ourselves for, for not getting these things done. I've actually started to really relax on that especially now that I'm older, because I'm getting older and I hope I'm getting wiser. Um, when I was younger, I used to be very hard on myself. And, like, now I'm kind of, you know, I've mellowed out a bit because I'm like, hey, things happen, you know. Sometimes I just want to kick back. Sometimes I just want to put my feet up. And if something doesn't get done, you know, it's like, okay, you know what I mean? That's fine, right? We don't have, I mean, I've really learned to just slow down, you know, because I am busy. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm really busy. <laughs> But in this busyness, you know, I've allowed myself to be human, you know, and I think that's that's really what Robert Bernie's talking about here, you know, it's like I've just allowed myself to be human. It's like, you know, I'm human. I get tired. There's days I, I can't work as hard as I can other days, you know what I mean? Like there's days that I can just go full force and full throttle and get all kinds of stuff. And then there's other days where I'm just like, whoa, I really need to just take a break, 
you know, and for the longest time in my lifetime, I've been, you know, not doing that, just going full force and not allowing myself to even slow down for a minute, you know, thinking, no, but i got to accomplish this and i got to do this and this and this. It's all personal goals. I'm doing it to myself, right? It's all personal goals and personal things that I'm doing. Nobody's standing over me saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. Um, I'm just doing it to myself, right? So I thought, okay, now I need to be able to allow myself to slow down, to enjoy the journey, to, hey, make a mistake or two, because that's definitely going to happen, and, you know, to be human, right? So I like what he says here, you know, he says, he said, um, because I was judging myself, right? And it, this is what he's saying. And impatient with myself, the rebel within me was rebelling through procrastinating. So he says, I was then judging myself for my procrastination, you know, for not getting it done. And then turning around and shaming myself for judging myself for my procrastination. <laughs> so he was just, you know, then he, he was just his own worst enemy. You know what I mean? He's just shaming himself, judging himself. And then judging himself because he was judging himself. You know, he says, I stopped judging and shaming myself in gross ways years ago, he says, I don't, I don't call myself names like stupid or loser or whatever. But he says, but the disease dynamic still kicks in on, on a much subtler level. So that's quite interesting what he says there. And he, he says, as we make progress uh, in treating ourselves better in recovery, the disease gets more subtle and cunning. So, he, so that's quite interesting. Um, you know, he says, this recent judgment shame of people would be like a 3.0 earthquake versus what used to be a 9.0 earthquake. So, yeah, I, I can see that. You know, like I know, because I, like I was talking about that yesterday, these internal tapes, because that's what he talks about a lot. And I've seen this on other websites, um, uh, talking about codependency and, you know, inner child work and he, having, having these these healing, you know, not, not healing, but these, these tapes that will roll around in our head from, from years ago. I was talking about that yesterday where, you know, possibly someone has hurt us and they've said something that they shouldn't have and, you know, it just stays with you. You know what I mean? Whatever it is, right? And what it could have been a coach, could have been a teacher. It doesn't have to necessarily be a parent. Could have been um, somebody, anybody, right? I've had some people say some horrible things to me in my lifetime, and mainly my mother, um, you know, and my dad as well, and other people, other siblings and other people. But, over, you know, the stuff that really stuck with me was the stuff my mother said, right? And it just plays around my head like, you know, like a tape recorder. And especially if things aren't going the way they should be. Like if I'm feeling, you know, extra you know, vulnerable, if I'm tired, if I got in trouble for something, and let's say I made a mistake at work, and it's like, uh-oh, all these tapes will start playing around, it's like, yeah, I'm just an idiot, I'm just, uh, I'm just a loser, I'm no good, I'm just this and that, right then, but I don't listen to that stuff anymore, because four and a half years ago, I started my healing journey, and I realized that none of that was my fault, you know, like, I mean, that, that was not my fault that my parents put this on me, and I don't have to listen to those tapes anymore, and I started to actually negate the tapes, and say stuff like, no, that's not true, I'm not a loser, I, I make mistakes because I'm a human being, everybody makes mistakes. And I started to talk it through, like literally out loud to myself in my apartment by myself, talk this stuff through. It's like, no, I am not a whore, I'm not a slut, I am not a bad person, <laughs> all this stuff. Like, it would just These negative things that would just come at me from wherever, whenever, right? These, these tapes that would play around, um, internal, you know internal stuff from the past, right, just trying to haunt me. And I'm like, you know, no, that's ridiculous. I, I, I'm none of those things. And, um, you know, if anything, I'm hard on myself, and I need to learn to love myself, you know. I started to really work on this, and so it has been a huge um, plus, you know what I mean? Like, But it has certainly didn't happen overnight, you know what I mean? And I, I'm still working on it. I still hear the tapes, and I still sometimes have to shut them out and say, you know what, no, I'm none of those things. And I have to go back to my positive affirmations because those things is really what got me through the first year. Positive affirmations really actually was what got me through the first year and also um, just being good to myself, being kind to myself. And, and at one point I was actually just holding myself. I didn't have anybody to hold me. So, I, And I'm just used to that. Most people, I mean, it's pretty pretty pathetic, but it's very true. And uh, that's just, you know, that's how my life has been pretty well the whole time. So I just held myself and I said, you know what, I so deserve so much better. You know, I was just talking to myself, and I just held my own hand, and I said, "My God, we're gonna make through. We're gonna make it through." You know what I mean? With, we're gonna do this, right? Talking to myself, and it was very, very helpful for for me to actually learn to love myself, and um, and and and, and negate that negative garbage that was put on me by my family, my mainly my parents, right? So, 
We have about a minute left, so you can finish this article up yourself. And uh, if you go to www.joy2meu.com and uh, take a look at the rest of that. So we'll be back. I'll be back on tonight, and as well as tomorrow morning, well, same time, same place. One child to be a survivor to another. Um, thanks very much for being here. I appreciate it. I had a guest here this morning, and I just appreciate everybody tuning into my show. You know, if you're having a hard time and you and you just think, oh my God, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to cope. You know, I don't know how I'm going to cope. I just don't know how I'm going to get through the day, or you know, because I know I've been there, right? Um, you make sure you get some help. You do not allow yourself to to be destroyed by past, right? We need to win this fight. And this is why I'm doing these shows. I'm doing these shows for a lot of reasons, and it's not just for me. Um, I really wanted to encourage people. That, you know, two of my brothers killed themselves. I was going to kill myself. My whole family suicidal, right? So, you know, I'm just telling you, you know, stick it out. There's better days. But there won't be any better days if you don't look for them, if you don't stick it out. There, There's always going to be some bad days, you know? And that's when we need to have a support system in place. We really need a support system. Contact me if you need any information. I'll be here. You can contact me here on Blog Talk Radio, Facebook. I'm everywhere. And I, I always try to get back to people, you know what I mean? Like, I really care about people. Make sure you stick around for those better days. They won't happen if you're not here. And I'm telling you what, don't give up. Not ever, not ever, not ever, right? Take good care of yourselves. Talk to you soon.